thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Um, it's great to see so many participants already uh, with us right on time today. Uh, so welcome and thank you again for joining us for today's Sankalp Dialogue Series uh, in partnership with the Somalia Response Innovation Lab. My name is Ariel Molino with IntelliCap and I lead our Sankalp Forum in Africa and uh, I'm based out of Nairobi. So we would love to know as you all join in uh, please just message us in the chat box. Let us know where you're from, where you're dialing in from today, and um, you know where, yeah, where you're coming from and what organization you're with. We would love to know, uh, you know, who's joining us today. So, uh, Charo, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, just to give a brief introduction on on Sankalp. Uh, Sankalp is the largest convening for the impact investing and entrepreneurial community for and by the Global South. We've hosted 21 editions of Sankap across India, Kenya, and Indonesia in the last 10 years. And we've launched this uh, digital Sankap Dialogue series earlier this year to provide additional touch points with our community throughout the year for the entrepreneurial ecosystem. As we're all sort of stuck in home, we're moving virtual, um, but we do, host, we do hope to be hosting more local editions of Sankop in the future. And, and Somalia is definitely a place we wanna go, which is why we're super excited um, about this session today. We are doing today's session in partnership with the Response Innovation Lab. Uh, and I'll, I'll let Nishant say a few more words about that in just a second. Um, but they are our lead partners in co-curating this. And, and thanks Nishant for, uh, for all of your, your support on that. Um, Sharu, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, just wanted to introduce our speakers today. We have, of course, Nishant Das from, from Somral, who we'll hear from in a few minutes. We have Abdul Karim from the City University of Mogadishu. We have Rama Ahmed from Asal Consulting and Mustafa Othman from Shakodun. Uh, so we'll be uh, getting the insights from all of these individuals shortly. Um, Charu, we can go to the next slide. Just to give you all a sense of what to expect today, uh, we'll have a uh, fairly brief remarks from Nishant Abdul Karim, Rama and Mustafa, so that we can reserve quite a bit of time for Q&A. So we do ask um, that you put your questions in the chat box. We'll be keeping track of them for all the speakers. Um, and then we'll have a really hopefully lively discussion um, for about half an hour or so at least towards, towards the end of this. Um, so Nishant, I will pass it over to you to give us a little bit more context about today um, and welcome. Awesome. Thanks, Ariel. And thanks, everyone, um, for, um, for uh, joining us today. Um, as, as Ariel mentioned, my name is Nishant. I'm with the Somali Response Innovation Lab. Uh, the Response Innovation Lab is a global collaborative platform. Our founding members include World Vision, Save the Children, Oxfam, as well as Civic and George Washington University as some of our, our founding members. Um, a bit about what we were doing. Uh, over the last two years, we were doing some research on the Somali startup and innovation ecosystem uh, in, together with George Washington University and the Somali Disaster Resilience Institute. Um, out of this research, we were creating some tools that were primarily focused on the domestic audience. Um, slide, please, Charu. Um, that um, we were doing some, uh, we created a publicly available directory to help people navigate that ecosystem um, we did in-depth relationship mapping, which looked at how each other. But we also realized um, that we were sitting on some really, really rich um, data. And all the initial tools we developed were primarily domestic, and we wanted to get the narrative of these amazing things happening in Somalia out to a public um, platform, a global platform. And so that's when we came across Startup Link. So Startup Link is a global ecosystem mapping and research center with tens of thousands of members around the world. They rank a thousand cities, a hundred countries around the world, um, and they have a very unique algorithm which has about 30 different moving parts, um, but they're primarily in three main baskets around quality, quantity, and business score. So we were able to take the data that we had, had been doing and help to migrate it onto the Startup Link platform. Um, and as you can see from this slide here, um, this last year, what was really interesting is that overall, Africa was kind of on a downward trajectory, a bit of a decline, but there was some really great news. There were 
um, Cape Verde and Somalia debuted um, in the ranking, in the top 100. Somalia is the 95th most innovative country for startups, which is quite amazing. I don't think it was surprising for anyone who works in Somalia, but definitely for many others who weren't as familiar. And so please check out our website, the Response Innovation Lab's website. Check out Startup Link's website to understand a bit more about um, uh, Somalia. You can look at different startups that are listed there and, and learn more. Um, but these are really exciting things um, that are worth celebrating. And so, yeah, check that out. Um, and we're excited to partner with, with IntelliCap to do the SANCALP. We did a session back in February um, to try and help add to this complex narrative and showcase some of these opportunities. And we're really excited to continue the dialogue today. Thank you. Ariel? Hey, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Nishant. Um, so we wanted to run a, a quick poll just to get your insights about Somalia for you guys who are participating. So we just want to know how you feel. Is, is Somalia a place that's a bit scary to you? <laughs> um, is it a place that has big risks but big potential? Um, is it, you know, you, you sort of want to learn more? Um, you know, is it is it an untapped market that you think is worth exploring, um, or it's just an awesome place to be? Uh, so just let us know what you think. Uh, just wanted to do this litmus test to see, to get the feeling of the folks in the room, and I think it'll be really helpful for our speakers um, to understand, you know, what what the sentiment is towards Somalia right now before we get started. So I will give everyone another about five seconds to respond. So please do put. Uh, put your vote in. Let us know how you feel. Right now, it's looking a bit, a bit mixed, mixed bag. Uh, another second or two, and then I'm going to end the poll. Um, okay, last second, last second. Vote, vote, vote. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end it and share the results. So, 45% of you guys said that it's an untapped market worth exploring. So definitely some positive sentiments there, which is absolutely fantastic to hear. Um, so without any further ado, I will welcome Abdul Karim uh, to share his insights from City University. Uh, Abdul Karim, over to you. Uh, Abdul Karim, you, uh, if you want to unmute yourself. Sorry. There we go. Here, yeah. Can you Perfect. hear me now? Loud and clear. Go Hi, ahead. Hi, my name is Abdul Karim Jama. I'm with the City <laughs> University of Mogadishu in, in Mogadishu, Somalia, obviously. Um, it, is, uh, uh, it is a startup. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, I have come back to Somalia uh, after a long absence and uh, we started City University even though there are 138 universities in Somalia today um, and one may wonder why would you need another university if uh, you have uh, so many universities and the discussion was uh, really something different. Uh, we wanted to uh, uh, do something that uh, adds to the uh, ability of the students to learn something they can take to the marketplace, to develop skills, uh, to uh, uh, take uh, 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 practical training on areas that the country needs. So we were focusing on fisheries and uh, agriculture and civil engineering and, and so on and so forth. And uh, we had some difficulty at the beginning because uh, the difficulties in uh, K through 12 education, which is not regulated and uh, uh, have very few, little quality control, uh, but we have come a long way to incorporate uh, practical training, internships, um, um, uh, research that's required for uh, every student to do for a year. Uh, and uh, we have seen the results. Our students are now uh, uh, doing graduate studies and working. And uh, we have been happy with the, the transformation that uh, we were able to do in a small sample of the students. Um, one of the challenges we faced is that uh, uh, many people who had uh, uh, graduate degrees or a lot of experience left to the country and many who studied outside and gained those experiences were not ready to come back to the country. Um, they had mortgages and uh, needed uh, 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 to make more money than was available locally. So we opted for uh, hiring uh, uh, professors and lecturers outside the country. 
we were able to uh, do through video conferencing uh, uh, lectures done by uh, professors in the US, in Norway, in Doha, uh, and uh, in Kenya. And uh, that, has, that was before COVID-19. And when COVID-19 uh, hit, we moved everybody to online. Um, we faced challenges, including the student access to internet, the student access to uh, terminal equipment, phones, telephones, and what have you in Mogadishu. We were pleasantly surprised uh, in, in a survey that uh, uh, 95 plus percent of the students had either a computer or a smartphone or both. And that's the sample that's studying at City University. That cannot be everywhere. And then people had access to internet. Uh, uh, more than half of them had internet in, in the places they lived. And the others were able to get uh, packages that are extremely inexpensive in comparison to other uh, uh, countries. Uh, a, a gig, one gigabyte of data costs about 50 cents, half a dollar in Mogadishu. Uh, I was in Dubai a few months back and that is $14 uh, for one gig. Uh, huge difference. And uh, so some students were, since they're not coming to school, were able to use the transport money that they saved from going to school and apply it to purchase data uh, for their smartphone uh, while studying at home. Uh, we use Google Classroom and, and, and Zoom. Now we have been evaluating um, after uh, over the summer and are looking to do Canvas uh, with Zoom, which is used by many institutions. Uh, our online uh, experience uh, uh, has some mixed results. Uh, younger students uh, tend to have more difficulty uh, and lack the discipline. I taught at uh, uh, two universities in the US and when I came to Mogadishu, they asked me to teach online and I taught online and the, 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 the challenge faced by younger students was evident. The more mature older students have the discipline uh, and did very well uh, by comparison. Uh, so, uh, but now the trend is to go online. Um, you know, many uh, institutions already uh, worldwide are saying next school year starting in September will be uh, going online. Uh, we have been successful in our relationships uh, uh, with uh, Yale University and University of New Haven and some of uh, which is part of the Yale system initially. Uh, some of our students now are starting a master's degree that's completely online while in Mogadishu uh, at the University of New Haven. Uh, and so the future of uh, higher education uh, in that direction is online and I think uh, 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 Somalia with uh, the internet that exists now that have come down in price 2014 uh, one megabit per second of uh, 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 connection was costing two thousand dollars because it was all on satellite uh, fast forward now we have a under sea cable it came down to 600 today you can get that same one megabit per second for fifty dollars in Mogadishu a second cable is coming and uh, it's uh, it's hard to uh, uh, to expect that in from from Somalia uh, uh, when you're out there and listening to the uh, doom and gloom. Um, some of the challenges we have seen, uh, City University and the Heritage Institute for Policy Studies completed a, uh, a study on uh, students and uh, education and labor and agriculture and fisheries. And one of the outcomes was there is a clear mismatch between the education students get and what the marketplace needs. Um, there, which there is a focus on getting college degrees. Uh, we Somalis like to do a lot of white collar work and most people don't like to do hands-on work. Uh, so too many people with degrees, very little uh, skills uh, uh, that you can take to the market. So there is uh, one of the recommendations from that study is to emphasize uh, vocational training and even in take the university degrees and break it down to a one-year certificate where they get certain hands-on skills and then two-year diploma where they get additional set of skills and then still go on to a degree program but by the time they graduate they'll have some skills that they can take to the marketplace. Uh, our university incorporates uh, a, a, a year-long research uh, where the student will do in their field uh, some relevant research of, you know they're doing civil engineers are doing construction in Mogadishu and problem with buildings, agriculture students are doing something similar, social work, marine sciences, and so on. We also require a semester-long internship where students actually go to a business and stay with them, uh, where they can see how 
their line of business works uh, in real life. Um, the uh, students who graduate, uh, in the old days when we had the Somali government, we had students who, every student who graduates from college was guaranteed a job by the government. That's no longer the case. So we have a lot of students graduating by the uh, thousands uh, with no employment uh, readily available. Uh, and when there are some available, the way uh, you get that job uh, is not as straightforward. So uh, for some time, we have been pushing uh, entrepreneurship and students to not only think about getting employment, but starting something and employing others. We've worked with Shakadon and uh, uh, Mustafa and company and Asal, and uh, uh, that, that is the trend uh, and, and that's the way to go. And we have seen some success. Some of our engineering students have started their own companies and have contracts and are working. We have IT students who set up uh, companies and are working. We have agriculture students who set up uh, uh, chicken farms and greenhouses who are uh, doing something for themselves. Uh, but it's not enough and we need to find ways of scaling that. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Somalia and think it's, uh, there is the proper official ranking, it may rank very low in uh, places to, that are business friendly. I don't know if there are many places that are more business friendly in Somalia if you know what you're doing, which means there are really no obstacles. You can start, you know, uh, Ariel uh, uh, Enterprises tomorrow and uh, you can actually be open by the end of the day for business, um, you know, and, and you can do some of the things afterwards uh, that may be some paperwork, but it's really business friendly if you know your way around. So we encourage you to come and uh, uh, do business in Somalia. Um, opportunities exist in Somalia, uh, in agriculture, in fisheries. Uh, we are partners with uh, Secure Fisheries in uh, Colorado in, in the US and the study they made uh, uh, indicates the volume of uh, illegal uh, fishing that goes on in Somalia and how much income is lost. We completed with them a study where we are uh, we're measuring the catch that's done by the Somali uh, fishermen and it's not that big um, uh, by comparison. Uh, so we're losing a lot there. But opportunities in fisheries, in uh, rice, in banana, in a lot of uh, 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 agricultural products, uh, if there are markets that are developed uh, uh, internally or in the neighboring countries or external, that there are big opportunities. Livestock, uh, we send uh, millions of uh, animals every year uh, to countries, but if they are processed internally and uh, uh, there's a, 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 a many, many ways to benefit from, uh, uh, from that. Also, um, the, uh, the ex fisheries export is now done through say Dubai or Kenya uh, where they are repackaged and then rebranded and then sent on. Uh, if that was done in Somalia and certification can be made to open it to external markets, it would help a great deal. So, Opportunities for investment uh, uh, exist uh, in City University. We have at City University uh, uh, um, some partners who are testing uh, greenhouses, employing and training uh, young people at IDP camps with plots, small plots that they can use. We have some land and a water well uh, that uh, we're working with uh, Gail and uh, Afau and others uh, on, on, on few small projects that need scaling. So we're really excited about uh, uh, the opportunities that exist in, uh, and the creativity that many young Somalis bring to the table, uh, uh, not just here, but uh, everywhere you go. Two quick uh, uh, short stories. Uh, we had a, uh, a student who graduated from our agriculture department and what he wanted to do was to uh, buy an incubator uh, to uh, hatch eggs so he can have uh, 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 chicken and grow it and sell it. And uh, the incubator was too expensive, I think $750 or something he was told. So he studied and uh, looked at it and built his own incubator. That young man now sells incubators in Mogadishu and he ships them to all regions of the country. He gave up on the, on the chicken uh, farm, but now he's an incubator salesman. And uh, he's, it costs him less than $150. He sells them for around $300 and he has a brisk market. Um, the entrepreneurship and the uh, creativity of the Somalis are, are, are all over the place. Uh, I was in Angola some time back and there was one guy uh, uh, building the first bakery in the entire country in Luanda, the capital. And so people go and, and really come up with uh, uh, the most amazing ideas uh, 
uh, or sometimes take the initiative and, and do those things. Maybe I'll reserve some uh, uh, time for questions, uh, uh, but uh, I think Somalia is a great place to do business. Uh, it's an easy place to do business, and uh, uh, you can contact any of the folks who are in, inside the country to, uh, to get a foothold if you're scared, and you can stay in, in some of the uh, buffered zones while you figure out things. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Abdul Karim. Uh, really positive insights there in terms of what the opportunity is for, for entrepreneurs and youth um, in Somalia. So uh, before I hand it over to Rama, just wanted to mention that, that we are live streaming on Facebook. So thank you, thank you, George, for getting that up and running. So hopefully we'll reach a few more people that way. Um, and I will hand it over now to Rama um, with Asal Consulting. Uh, so Rama does a lot of capacity building and leadership training um, through ASAL and she's going to share some of her uh, insights in terms of the uniqueness of, of doing business in Somalia and some of the opportunities there. Uh, Rama, over to you. Um, thank you, Ariella. Um, and, and thank you, Abdekreen. I think uh, he laid it out. We're, we're talking about uh, one of the um, purest market economies that you can find um, in, in Somalia. And of course, there are a lot of opportunities that come with that. Um, and, and to some extent, perhaps maybe some challenges. Um, so ASAL, we work on, so we work in a number of areas. Uh, we, we support private uh, public sector um, reform activities. And we also work to support uh, business environment reform. And for the purpose of today's discussion, I will be focusing on the latter. We work with business leaders to um, raise awareness, uh, but also to ensure that the private sector has input to ongoing uh, legal and regulatory reforms that are being undertaken um, by governments. And this includes supporting the uh, adaptation and enforce, uh, enactment of um, practical and relevant business policies and laws. An example of that right now is a company's law that has just been passed uh, in Somalia. We also help the business community in uh, advancing effective business policies at, um, with the federal and state legislators. Um, and the, su the support that we provide um, at the env business environment level includes helping businesses organize or mobilize in particular, um, some of the work that we, fo we focused on there has been with um, women businesses, particularly, um, who are not generally very well represented in existing, um, I guess, um, associations or organizations. And if they are participating, maybe perhaps not very visible. Um, but lastly, we also help individual businesses to um, co corporatize um, because there is a lot of informality in terms of how business is done in, in, in Somalia. One thing that our work emphasizes is that it's really crucial to achieve the right balance between development impact and business benefit, right? Especially in an environment uh, like Somalia. Um, if I can touch a little bit on our work that we do with the Somali Chambers of Commerce, um, so we work with the Chambers of Commerce to build their organizational capacity um, and the uh, Commerce, Somali Chambers of Commerce is a representative and advocacy organization. It's of and for the business people of Somalia. It describes itself as an um, independent business membership organization with formal government recognition. Um, and its primary purpose is twofold. It's one in supporting the business community in Somalia and also to, to promote the country and into, uh, to the international business uh, markets. Following um, its closure in um, 1991 due to civil war, the chambers um, recommenced operations in 2006, and it currently has about 1,500 uh, 500 business members. Our goal in terms of the work that we're working with them on right now is to strengthen their capacity to work with government in advancing the economic growth agenda um, by enhancing the legitimacy of the chambers as a representative of the private sector and improving their capacity to engage in evidence-based dialogue and delivering goods and services to its members. 
Now, as a result of the ongoing legal and regulatory reforms that are being undertaken by government, um, we've particularly focused through this year on supporting, uh, le providing legal capacity to the chambers while also laying out strategies and plan uh, plans for strengthening their organizational um, and institutional capacities. Now, an example again is um, where the focus has been is business, the company law, where businesses who've been you know, operating in this very, very free market <clears throat> that where regulations have really not been around are now um, supposed to not only understand the new company's law, but they're supposed to also comply with that. And um, the processes um, where we come in in the process is to help them uh, su support them with that. During COVID-19, um, the private sector is really partnered with government in their fight against COVID-19. Um, and this has taken shape in various ways. One of the ways for anyone who's actually uh, in Somalia or ever called Somalia would know that um, the mobile phone providers have been playing a very significant role. Um, and that role includes the operators kind of ring back service every time you call. There was uh, messages raising awareness around COVID-19, social distancing, washing your hands, etc. cetera. Um, another thing that started happening, in, happening immediately is the local production of PPE, um, which is also something that um, I guess businesses, <laughs> businesses were not there who provide PPE per se, but um, once, um, once, I guess, international air, airspace was closed um, for a country that relies heavily on import and export, um, a lot of, uh, there are a few things that stood out. And the Somali economy um, is, is massively reliant on uh, remittances, uh, revenues and import, uh, but also on foreign aid. And all of those are sectors that are very prone to shocks. Um, and COVID-19 was a serious shock. Um, one, of the, one of the things around the flight, flight restrictions uh, around importing of goods uh, has had a tremendous impact on Somali businesses. The main export areas uh, that the Canadians talked about around livestock, um, you know, bananas, uh, scrap metal, charcoal, fishery. Um, but also what's really interesting is that the top imports um, is raw sugar, concentrated milk, rice. So we're talking about food and you know household goods, and this this really did impact um, the 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 markets. And interestingly enough, as part of their effort to respond, the private sector engaged in uh, conversations with the government, but also with themselves to try to then redirect some of their investments. Obviously, we're talking agriculture, which is a sector that takes longer in terms of it, its investment to reap its rewards. But the, the immediate focus and willingness to uh, scale up by the private sector to invest in the, in the agricultural markets has been a very serious discussion. And I think COVID-19 has reset a lot of focus for businesses who traditionally focus or preferred to import certain goods. Um, in terms of our work when it comes to COVID-19, we work, so businesses in Somalia are traditionalist businesses who operate in a trust economy. This means we do business face-to-face. -face. And COVID-19 meant that you could not do business face-to-face -face, um, uh, or not as easily anyway. So the biggest challenge around that has been um, the fact that we've had to, um, take a lot of crucial engagement, and we needed to try to move that engagement online. Um, and our focus has been to try to ensure the very traditional businesses to not disconnect and retreat any further. Um, so a lot of creative approaches have been used by us in order to work during the COVID-19 period. And this includes, you know, drumming up participation for discussions and meetings and and really trying to focus on making sure that it's as easily accessible as possible, which meant everything had to be done on the phone. So um, WhatsApp really works well, but where we needed to have more detailed conversations and, and, and Zoom and meetings and engaging people, 
it also meant that we had to have people going around and literally um, you know, helping business uh, people download Zoom for whatever conversation, not even necessarily a conversation with us, show them quickly how it's used, um, and then be able to, um, to not shy away from discussions or engagement um, if they're told that it was on Zoom. Um, and then lastly, we recorded everything that happened online just as a proof of concept and circulated it wide and far to whoever may want to have a look, just to, again, remove any sense of intimidation that may be attached to coming on an online meeting and not maybe being able to see who's on it, et cetera. Um, learning, learning and adapting um, happens at different speed for different sectors, but also for different people, right? So in the fascinating thing with the Somali business community is we learn we learn and adapt only when absolutely a necessity. We don't learn and adapt as a precautionary measure, right? So it really has to, you know, reach a point where there is no other option. Um, and what's interesting about that is, yes, we may leave it until that point, but then when it's time to learn and adapt, the benefit it is happens very, very quickly. Um, so teleworking and getting online, I think the learning for us has been we probably should not have, um, we should not have been on the opposite scale of the complacency um, uh, approach or thinking around, oh, someone that is far away who wants me to just jump online or jump on the phone, they really don't want to do real business with me, they really don't want to work with me, and we've allowed for that. So we. We haven't up until COVID-19 really done anything to counter that narrative. Um, and it's important to counter that narrative as we also encourage businesses to open up to working with international partners or investors, et cetera, or accessing even international markets. So that's a learning for us that we probably needed to push a lot uh, sooner. Um, and then another learning has been a greater focus. There's a need to have a greater focus on supporting individual businesses to inc increase their internal IT knowledge, right? So if IT not, because IT knowledge is very low, um, it's, if, if, and businesses don't necessarily um, feel that they have to use that, or if they don't, they don't use it. Um, one of the things that we're realizing now is in, in today's economies, it's very important to actually support IT literacy and IT knowledge to businesses. Lastly, uh, in terms of, so in terms of uh, focus on where we would want to scale up or need to scale up, two things come to mind. One is around resources to support mobilization and organization, particularly of two types of, 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 of business groups. And one is young businesses and entrepreneurs, and the other one is women businesses. And, and, and these two types of business communities are not necessarily represented in organizations like the chambers at the moment because it hosts a different type of, 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 of business, uh, uh, business community. Um, and, and, it's, and, and it's really important to have opportunities for these types of groups to be able to be nurtured and supported um, in, in where they are, as opposed to um, necessarily disappearing under these bigger structures. And then the second thing is an investment in strengthening management capabilities at individual business level. Again, something that is really, really important if we are to help the business community not only grow, but also uh, for the private sector to be able to connect to other sectors. I'll stop there for now, and then if anyone has any other questions, I'll be available. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rama. I really appreciate that. You highlighted so many, so many relevant uh, challenges, but equally exciting opportunities uh, for, for the region. So please, if anyone does have questions for Rama, do include them uh, in the chat box and we'll come back to her in a few minutes. Um, we're going to take a quick pause now uh, to run just another poll for, uh, for you all. So the, the next poll that we're going to ask is we just want you to share where you're from. Um, let me see, George, yeah, thanks. Um, so just let us know where you're based. Uh, it's, we had a very diverse set of individuals um, 
register from from really all over the world and we just sort of wanted to share that all with you so i'll give it another five seconds or so for you to just tick in um where you're joining us today from um and we'll we'll share that out with you so you all can see the diversity of interest uh, of where people are really looking at somalia um, as a place not just to do business but as rama also mentioned sort of how um how development meets business and entrepreneurship in, in the country. Um, so I'll give you another one or two seconds and then um, we'll close the poll and share that out with you. Um, George, if you wanna go ahead and share with us the results. <laughs> okay, many, many of us uh, based on the continent here, which is great. Uh, some folks from Asia, Europe, and some people woke up very early uh, in, in the Americas. So thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, and great to see some diversity there in terms of interest for, for Somalia. Um, so last but most certainly not least, I will hand it over to Mustafa uh, of Shakodun, who works extensively with entrepreneurs and, and getting them financing and getting them ready to, to improve their businesses in Somalia. Uh, so Mustafa, over to you. We'd love to hear your perspectives on, on some of the challenges that your entrepreneurs are experiencing and, and the opportunities that COVID has really offered. Put a bit more detail to it now that we start Thank you. the pandemic center. So could I have my slides? Um, it's okay. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Mustafa, and uh, I'm the communication and technology manager at uh, Shakadon, which is an organization based in uh, throughout Somalia and Somaliland. Uh, it was founded in 2011. Um, uh, providing four main services, youth employment, youth entrepreneurship, uh, private sector development, and also uh, technology for development. Uh, we have also spinned off a, a social enterprise called Harhub, which we founded in 2018, um, really to focus and support uh, young uh, innovators who want to establish uh, Oh, Mustafa, I think we, we've lost your audio. I think just unmute yourself. Yeah, can there we go. Thanks. Yeah, now we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. I'm using my phone for, for the camera, and uh, unfortunately, my laptop doesn't have a camera. So maybe I'm getting some calls, so that's why it's uh, disconnecting. So just in case, uh, bear with me if it does that again. Um, so Harhub uh, focuses on uh, youth incubations, uh, trainings on entrepreneurship, uh, as well as uh, funding through its uh, Tarmiya Fund um, uh, that they've uh, recently established with support from Shahadon and other partners. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to uh, share uh, share story of the three resilient uh, businesses that we've supported uh, in 2018 and 19. Uh, who have really, um, you know, done an amazing work uh, during the pandemic and have re sort of um, re-engineered their businesses uh, by providing new services and new products um, so that, you know, to stay alive and stay afloat. So two businesses that were um, uh, quite interesting and did most of their uh, business online and over the phone uh, were, you know, a, a business called uh, Sami Online, which was a marketplace, and also Dalba Food, uh, also providing uh, over the phone delivery and also through a mobile app delivery services for, for snacks uh, to offices and schools. And both of those businesses, uh, you know, really relied on um, you know, young people, you know, and also uh, you know, families living in the country who could come online, buy their goods. But this was, uh, uh, this was sort of stopped, you know, there was a big stop because of the, uh, remittance that was coming in. And as a result, the purchasing power went down. Uh, this put, uh, you know, the, the, there was a huge dip in their, in their sales. And as a result, they needed to innovate. So with support of Harhab and Shakadon, uh, providing coaching and, and uh, support during this uh, period, have came up with an idea to, uh, to, to provide new services that was in line with what people would need now. So Sami came up with a, a delivery service uh, where they delivered uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, groceries uh, to households. Um, so instead of just doing online, uh, digital, uh, I mean, uh, electronic uh, sales, 
but they now said, okay, we have motorbikes, we've had it. They've increased that and then started delivering now for food. And the reason for that was simply because people were too afraid in the beginning to come out of their homes uh, because they were afraid of infections. And these young people took advantage of, of that and saw an opportunity to, to, to fill that gap. Same thing with, with uh, uh, Dalba Food, the, the, the main customers were schools and also offices. They had to close. Um, and, and as a result of that, um, they needed to now find a new way to, to continue to, to stay in business. And this, now they start providing lunch and also dinner, uh, delivery services to, to people's homes, which was great. And this, another business which has uh, done uh, extremely well uh, was uh, Soji Fruit. Uh, Soji uh, did milling, so they, they would buy a local sorghum, um, clean it, mill it, and then package it. And uh, this was actually used for uh, uh, Somali uh, breakfast uh, called Lahoh and Angela, uh, whichever wherever you are. And, um, and, and as a result of this, um, the business again wasn't doing so well, and they needed to find other ways or other product lines to also. Uh, um, uh, to add to, to continue to make, to be in business. And uh, these young guys, again, uh, uh, saw two opportunities, uh, ghee, uh, Somali ghee, and also uh, local uh, honey, uh, locally produced. Um, the Somali saw this as a, as a preventive measure for, for, for COVID infections. And uh, as a result, they saw this as an opportunity and started to package um, honey and also ghee and selling it in main markets in, in, Hargeisa, uh, in, in Hargeisa. So uh, both of those, uh, biz, uh, um, biz, uh, three, those, all three of those businesses have done extremely well uh, since the pandemic and um, have, 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 you know, have, have um, I, I mean, a lot of other businesses have failed, um, but what really helped them is, is uh, seeing and identifying opportunities uh, that could of, uh, be of benefit to them. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, that's it. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mustafa. Um, and thanks to everyone for putting your questions in. We've got some really, really fantastic questions uh, that have come in. So I will just field a couple of those. Um, actually, Mustafa, maybe I will, I'll start with you since, uh, since you're here. There's one question around uh, IP rights in, in Somalia. Um, is, is there protection for entrepreneurs and innovators intellectual property? Um, is, that, is that sort of well governed? Um, what's, what's sort of the landscape like there for, for entrepreneurs when it comes to intellectual property? Unfortunately, that doesn't exist. There's no act on, uh, there's not, nothing like that yet. IP rights, or uh, data protection laws, all those things really don't exist yet in, in, in Somalia and Somalia. Okay. So pretty much you're, you're on your own. So it might be a good place, yeah. an easy place to do business as Abdul Karim said to enter, but <laughs> you might not have too much protection on, on that side. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sort of touching again on, on sort of questions around the government. Rama, I'll come to you for the next question. Um, there was a question around information availability being a, a real hindrance for, for Somalia. So you mentioned the Companies Act um, and Harish, uh, from, from the audience is saying he's trying to access the draft of the law, but he's unable to find it on the government website. So I think using that as an example in terms of, you know, accessibility of information and data in Somalia. Do you just want to comment um, on, on that around the, the availability of, of data and information in Somalia? Yeah, so availability of data and information is limited um, and it's, it's actually privileged quite often. Public information is quite privileged. Um, and it's, it's one of the reasons that makes complying with um, especially new laws and regulations very, very difficult. Um, and as such, um, government, of course, recognizes that so they will not rush to uh, enforce very uh, um, fiercely right away. Um, and one of the things we are looking at is, is for this to not be the case, i.e. for the availability of, of, of laws and regulations, especially those that affect uh, private sector and, and, and markets, et cetera, but also citizens that it is something that should be made available. The company's law specifically should have been on the ministry's website. Um, I'll, I'll have a look, but it is something that, that definitely should be there. 
Um, and again, I'm, I'm not surprised <laughs> it's not really accessible. Um, it's, it's a work in progress. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Rama. Um, the next question, Abdul Karim, I'll, I'll come to you. Uh, there's a specifically a, a question around transactions uh, with, with foreign entities. So since the, the financial system in Somalia is not tied so strongly with international banks, because I know it's mostly dollarized uh, versus the local currency there, um, how, how is that a challenge for, um, for sort of managing connections with, with foreign entities and, and financial transactions in that sense? Would you be able to comment on that? Generally, yes, uh, the, um, uh, it is true that the banking system is not well developed or well connected to the outside world, uh, but there is a Hawala system that uh, many Somalis rely on for uh, uh, sending money to family, uh, businesses use it to send money to uh, their partners uh, overseas. So uh, as uh, Rahma was saying, uh, we import just about everything, uh, including food, and uh, uh, on any given day, uh, there are uh, uh, ships that are offloading goods that are purchased uh, from all corners of the world, China, what have you, and people are sending money back and forth. So it is true the bank, you cannot just transfer directly uh, dollars, for example, now to uh, some places, euros are easier, but people find ways using hawalas to, uh, to send money uh, to just about everywhere and receive money from uh, all over the world. Yeah, and I think that that really speaks to sort of the levels of innovation and, and potential, I mean, leapfrogging that really could be done um, in Somalia, given, given that, that vast network of, of cash transactions. Uh, well, yeah, and mo mobile money, as you know, I'm sorry, uh, yes, is, uh, is uh, one of the most advanced uh, countries is Somalia, where uh, people on, in all over the country, in the countryside, in the cities, use mobile money for all transactions, including paying salaries, rent, purchasing, whatever. <laughs> yeah, and and just sort of while we're on the topic of of money, and Mustafa, maybe I'll come to you. Um, just wanted to raise the issue around access to finance for entrepreneurs because we know this is this is a really big, a big challenge, not just for Somalia but for many entrepreneurs kind of on the continent. Um, we know banks lending is is inaccessible and highly expensive, um, and you know there's not so many foreign investors who are playing in the space. Um, Islamic banking could, you know, could possibly contribute to that since a lot of international financiers aren't necessarily used to that. Um, so could you just give us some, shed some light on, on the situation of financing for entrepreneurs? Where, where are they actually able to get that money? Is it mostly coming from friends, family? Um, you know, I, I know you guys do a lot of work directly with that. Would love to hear your, your thoughts there. Yeah, sure. So just uh, just to go back a bit about the question that was raised about uh, the IP, IP laws, the, the government do actually try a lot to ensure uh, there's no copycats or counterfeiting. And um, they actually try to uh, you know, root that out. Uh, so if a company wanted to come in and somebody was to copy, they actually take, do take a step, although the law is not fully established yet. Okay, regarding the uh, access to finance in, uh, in the Somali region, Somalia, and also Somalia, it's a huge challenge for young people to borrow, uh, especially if you're a startup and uh, only now, uh, you know, thinking of starting your own enterprises, it's actually even more, more difficult. Uh, it's also difficult because you need, uh, you know, need a number, you know, a rich, rich uncle or a guarantor that is able to take uh, the risk with you. And um, unfortunately, the banks, um, won't allow uh, people to default or, um, uh, or accept a business fails and therefore no prepayments. So the, the, the banks are of course risk aggressive and, um, and there's you know, guarantors that need to be there. Um, so th so that's, a, that's one issue. Secondly, that is also very expensive as you mentioned earlier. Uh, it could be anything from five to 20 plus percent just uh, uh, on, on profit rates just to uh, borrow some money. Uh, again, it's very expensive and it puts uh, people in debt, if the, especially if the business does not succeed. And there is also no uh, way of them also, uh, because it's all based on Sharia compliant loans, uh, there's also no way for them to uh, invest in uh, things that they cannot see. Uh, for example, someone who's developing a new innovative software 
um, uh, that they you know they cannot see it's very difficult for them to to, to invest in that kind of uh, businesses um, secondly uh, so there are there are some uh, institutions out there who are now trying to fill the gap um, who are you know some donors who you know support the banks to you know, take some risks with them uh, which has helped in uh, in some aspects but again there's the challenge is still there uh, more recently, uh, through you know our partner Harhab and Shabadon and Premier Bank have launched a, uh, a, a new program, a, a new new fund called Tarmia Fund. Uh, it's a million dollar fund, specifically really targeting and supporting young people through equity financing. So it's not a loan, it's not a uh, grant based, but it's an equity based uh, loan um, uh, funds. So it, so that Harhab takes a small stake in, in the company. Uh, but in, in return for that, they get a lot of coaching, trainings, and support along the way. This has, has you know, if the business fails, it fails. But the most important thing about this approach, uh, which no one is doing in the country at the moment, is uh, it really doesn't, it, there's that sense of a uh, person, not, you know, if he fails, he fails, you know. But we try our best not to ensure that he doesn't fail. So far, over um, 11 businesses have been invested. And all of them are so far successful. They've been, you know, operating for over a year so far, and so far have been very successful. So this approach is the kind of approach that banks and other, you know, donors should encourage uh, an equity financing uh, model. So grants, really, again, grants don't work very well. Thanks, thanks for that, uh, Mustafa. And maybe Abdul Karima, I'll, I'll come to you with the next question. Um, you know, at IntelliCap, we've actually been doing a bit of a bit of research on sort of assessing the landscape in Somalia. And when it when it comes to financing and investment, the diaspora do play quite a significant role, um, and and they do do some some you know direct investments into businesses in 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 Somalia. But obviously, with with COVID, those you know, those numbers of remittances and diaspora funds might be dropping significantly because of the challenges, the, the sort of economic downturn that we're facing globally. Um, yeah. Do you want to, do you have any comments on that, on what you think might, what, the, what, I mean, any sense on what that negative impact might be and, and the, the importance of that role of diaspora? Yeah, it, it is uh, true that uh, the, the largest uh, money that comes into Somalia is uh, from the diaspora every year, com even compared to uh, partners and uh, uh, development aid that comes. Um, somewhere around two billion people mentioned dollars. Um, that has uh, 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 fallen in during the last few months while COVID uh, was taking. Some people are uh, unemployed, some people uh, uh, even the Hawalas, uh, many of the Hawalas were having problems sending money back and forth uh, during the COVID. Some of the money physically leaves Somalia uh, or goes to Somalia uh, by plane, and that was not possible when the when the uh, flights were shut down. So it had a significant impact, and and the most important impact is to for those people who live off of that money uh, and you know forget businesses. Uh, and so uh, there is recovery. Uh, if, if uh, the, now the flights are opening and uh, uh, in, in many places uh, things are picking up, uh, but it ha had an impact. There is a study underway now uh, on the economic impact that uh, 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 we're doing and uh, early indications are uh, significant uh, loss of uh, revenue, both in the federal member states and the federal government. During the COVID, uh, there were tax holidays on basic foods uh, uh, by the federal government to, to help uh, alleviate some of the problems, but also uh, a reduction in investments and in, uh, uh, in uh, revenue coming from family members in the diaspora. Uh, many uh, international entities uh, have frozen projects and uh, 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 arrangements that were underway until they figure out what's happening with COVID-19. So, a uh, huge impact. It's yet to be identified in numbers. Yeah, most definitely. I think we're seeing that globally as, as well. Yeah. Um, Mustafa, I have one more question for you and then Rama, I'll, I'll come back to you. Uh, so Mustafa, Harish has another question. He's asking, you know, what, what do you think the correct instrument, if there could be such a, a correct instrument uh, for foreign agencies to invest in Somalia? What's sort of the best case scenario looking like? Um, there are some credit guarantees with DFI's Gagara facility from the World Bank um, that are providing loans to then on-lend to enterprises. 
um, but the interest rates are, are, are still high. Um, so just wondering what, what your thoughts on, are they on the right track? What could potentially be a better solution there? Yeah. So first of all, let's not use the word interest rates. Uh, it's, it's called a profit, profit rate. Uh, interest is not allowed in, uh, in, in, in Islam. So therefore they don't practice uh, using interest or interest words. It's okay. <laughs> um, secondly, um, so to be honest, it's, there is no uh, perfect uh, solution. Um, uh, the most important thing is that uh, investors need to understand is Somalia is, is risky, but it's also a very important um, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and a virgin country where whatever you invest, uh, the, you know, the, the profits could be very high. Um, uh, some of the things that we've experimented as, as Shabadon, uh, of yeah, most of uh, you. Working, yeah. with, working with the banks is a, is a very good solution. For example, with the Gara Fund and the way, uh, you know, donors funnel through uh, an agency or the banks uh, is a good approach. Uh, but again, we've seen uh, some of the challenges with that. We've still seen still a strict uh, procedure. Sorry. So the strict uh, procedures that the bank had already in place is still there, even with guarantors and support from, from donors. So there's still the, you know, the restrictions in terms of um, the guarantors um, uh, having fixed, fixed, fixed assets and things like that are still there. So, so that's, that's one challenge. So maybe working through uh, funds. So for example, the uh, Somalian government has recently announced a fund. Uh, Shabaton has announced a fund. Uh, I'm sure there's other funds that have been announced by, by some banks. Uh, lowering all those sort of um, um, hurdles or barriers that are there. Um, but again, you know, you know, ensuring that you know, the banks and these financial institutions do take risks with the young innovators and entrepreneurs so that they are able to uh, um, you know, try out some, some business ideas that could potentially work and could become the next Google, the next Facebook. So, so I think there is no, uh, you know, a, 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 you know a solution. Some of the things we've also piloted that has worked is a mix of loans, grants, and also um, uh, equity, or maybe mix of loans and grants. So having a small amount uh, as, grant, as grants, so, for example, because you cannot lend as cash, because that will become interest, you can only give assets. You can only, so, for example, if someone wants to set up a business, you can probably pay for their rent, you can, you can buy something for them, an asset, but you can't give a loan as money and then put money on top. So, so one of the things we piloted is providing 30% grant and 70% loan. Uh, that has also worked very well and encouraged people to, um, to innovate and, and because sometimes you may buy them, you know, uh, items and, and uh, materials or assets, but they don't have the operational uh, funds to be able to operate. And that's also another challenge with the bank, because the banks will never give you money, they will give you, they will give you assets, or they'll buy you a car, they will buy you uh, land or whatever, but they won't give you cash. And people need the cash in order to, in order to operate their businesses. Right, right. Thanks. And the sort of multi-pronged approach definitely makes a lot of sense uh, as entrepreneurs also sort of have different needs, right, depending on, on where they are in their journey. Um, so, so thanks, thanks for that, uh, Mustafa. Rama, we're, we're, we, we're almost out of time, um, but I did want to come back to you. You had uh, sort of mentioned in, in, when you were speaking about the low representation of women, particularly in your work with the Chamber. Um, just wondering from your perspective, What's, what are some of the, the root challenges there around why women are, maybe are not participating? Um, I mean, assuming they are running businesses there and, and, you know, why are they not necessarily participating in that type of fora as, as compared to, to male counterparts? So maybe if you could just touch on some of the specific challenges that you see women entrepreneurs facing in, in, in that sense. Yeah. So w women entrepreneurs are actually concentrated in the micro. Um, um, economy, that is that is one massive factor. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not in the medium as well, but they are concentrated in the micro. Um, the second thing is, I think if we understand the chambers as an institution and how it's organized, it it is it is male dominated, it is male led, and it is very traditionalist. 
um, and for that reason, it's not very easy for um, women businesses to participate meaningfully. I think the, the private sector in terms of how it's organized when it comes to the gender lens, um, the, 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 the disparities are very um, clear and they come out through everything from representation to even how finance is accessed as we talked about earlier to how businesses are supported, marketed, how opportunities are shared. All of this um, is done differently between uh, female and male businesses. Another thing is that just because they're not in the, uh, like formally within the chambers um, visibly, it doesn't mean that women businesses are not being represented. We surveyed, we did a study of women businesses and surveyed 950 women in the market across Mogadishu, um, Hergesa, and Gerowe. And out of that, 77% said that um, a private individual represents their business interests, not an organized group. And out of the 77%, they, 66% of that said it was a family member, right? So women have different strategies that they use for maneuvering the markets, uh, but they very much still exist and work within the markets. Thanks, Rama. And I'm just gonna have two more questions because I don't wanna go too much over time. Uh, Abdul Karim, I'll come to you uh, because you had made the comment earlier that uh, you know, Somalia is sort of open for business, right? It's, it's sort of an untapped market. Um, but there's a question here, particularly around corporate governance, right? So maybe it's easy to sort of get business going. And sorry, Rama, I'm, I'm direct, redirecting your question to, to Abdul Karim here. I know it was mentioned for Rama in the chat. Um, but particularly when it comes to corporate governance and people who are looking to invest, uh, especially, you know, international folks and possibly even diaspora as well, when you're putting your money in, um, you know, there's, there's lack of documentation of finance, um, even when you're potentially talking about boards and, and infrastructure in that sense. Um, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, on improving corporate governance maybe at an enterprise level? And, and would that actually incentivize um, more, more finance moving to some of these entrepreneurs in your perspective? Um, it probably would, and uh, in, in time it will happen. Uh, it is, uh, I think, important to understand the, uh, the, the basis of uh, the thriving businesses in Somalia. There's, uh, there are a lot of companies making huge returns. Uh, some of the people who invest uh, money in, uh, in businesses that are in Somalia and get a return of uh, 20%, uh, 25%, uh, 30% annually, uh, these are numbers we don't hear uh, anywhere else just about. Of course, there are some risks, uh, but if you know how the system works uh, uh, as a Somali uh, people, there's a great deal of trust uh, uh, built in. There's a great deal of uh, uh, networks and family connections and people uh, who know each other, who pull resources, who uh, really without much documentation uh, put together some money, start a project, uh, share profits. It's not a, 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 an anomaly. This is the norm. Uh, of course, every now and then something uh, goes haywire and people lose money. But for the majority, uh, it is a, a way of, it's a madness that has its own meaning. Uh, but yes, the, the documentation you're looking for and uh, uh, someone coming from outside who wants to secure their finances, who wants uh, legal protections, who wants uh, a recourse that can be put as one, two, three, and he knows where it starts and where it ends. We're not there yet. Uh, but working within the system, finding reliable partners, uh, many organizations uh, 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 who work with international partners uh, uh, like ourselves and uh, Asal and others have to do uh, board meetings and annual audits and have been doing, but now it's a, it's a requirement that more and more organizations are getting used to. So having budgets and uh, you know, uh, uh, proof of uh, your audited financial uh, accounts by an external auditor and um, monitoring and quality by an external entity. So there are many things that are coming into place that will give uh, the warm and fuzzy to people who want to put money into Somalia. But within the Somali community, it is really, uh, it's not as bad as it seems. Uh, and there is a, 
uh, sufficient corporate governance and uh, guarantees that are built in the system with a lot of trust that make it work. I don't know if that gives you the answer you need, but uh, that's how, how I see it. Thanks. Thanks so much, Abdul Karim. You actually gave me a perfect segue to my, my last and final question uh, coming back to Mustafa. So, uh, and again, I'll, we'll try to keep it brief so that we can wrap up without being too much over time. But Abdul Karim, you really touched on a lot of things. I mean, trust, co-investments, partnerships, which also, you know, that, that lends some level of comfort, if you will, or credibility when investing in some of these markets. Um, and Joshua, great to see you, Joshua. Thanks for joining. Is an old colleague of ours. Um, Joshua is asking Mustafa, you know, what, what is, is, are there any frameworks or initiatives to catalyze co-investments uh, in Somalia? Specifically, he was asking around diaspora, but as Abdul Karim mentioned, you know, partnerships and, and cooperations are really critical. Um, so do you see any, um, you know, any, any efforts there to sort of facilitate or encourage co-investments uh, for enterprises in Somalia? Uh, okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm not gonna use a camera this time because my mobile just keeps going off. So I'll just do it without a camera. So just to answer that, I've just put some uh, links to our websites there. Um, there is uh, an ideas we've been trying out actually for a while now uh, using crowdfunding. Uh, to get diasporas to also uh, co-invest or co uh, not to co-invest at the moment but, but also just to contribute to youth business ideas so i put some websites there so it's not so termia is the, um, a crowdfunding platform uh, run by Harhab, hub um, uh, although we manage it at shabadon because we have a technical department and then we also set up a brochure cab and also so cab so so cab uh, is the most the oldest one it's been around for for a number of uh, years now um, and it's really intended for community projects. So, so Kabla.com is intended for community projects. And these projects um, can range from uh, roads, to hospitals, and so on and so forth. So over about over a million uh, USD has been raised through this, including uh, donor matching funds uh, through Somalia Stability Fund. Um, unfortunately, some of the challenges that, that exist because, of, uh, because there is no, um, because the banks, uh, are not uh, how can i say because because there is no uh, uh, payment gateways that support the local banks for example stripe and paypal uh, unfortunately don't support merchant accounts and this has been a major challenge uh, here has always been uh, trying to get uh, you know get, get these companies to allow and connect to these banks and allowing us to have merchant accounts so we can have crowdfunding uh, and receive money from the diasporas the, the, the challenge is still there. The challenge is still there. However, as a way uh, through, for example, SOCAB, what people have been doing is they've been sending money directly to the committees who were building these uh, initiatives. So a good percentage of the money did come from actually quite a lot of it, especially now in our Seoul, uh, in our Seoul, uh, Seoul uh, region. Uh, actually, most of the money came from the diaspora. And some of the challenges still exist because when you present it to the donors, oh, you know, 100,000 came in for this road from a diaspora, then again, uh, the risk aspect comes in. You know, was this a money laundering or was it, you know, how did it come in? And going back and actually trying to identify every single person who sent it, so keeping a diary of everybody who sent the money, uh, enlisting it, has always been a huge challenge. Although we had to do it because there's no other way, otherwise the owner would not do the matching, uh, to do the matching for these uh, communities. But we had to find a guy who was driving, a, you know, a truck, who contributed to his uh, community uh, to build a road? The community contributed a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars a road. We have to call him and actually get his details, and only that way you can. So the challenge of you know money laundering was a challenge generally because of the financial system not well connected to the international uh, financial markets has been a huge challenge. Uh, we're trying to overcome this now by registering uh, uh, Shakaton as an uh, you know an institution outside of the country. So that we're able to still can, you know, provide um, car funding and allow diasporas to contribute to some of these projects that we are, we are co-financing. Co and um, this is the only way, unfortunately, to actually either go through a company that is already registered outside for them to you know, you know, open an account for us and receive international contributions for businesses. Because I believe there is, um, even in the past we've received, you know, a, young entrepreneurs diasporas who are coming into the country and looking to invest in some business ideas and some who are also reaching out through our facebook's and so on and so forth 
but there is no easy way to do it. There's still an issue of, uh, you know, sending money and only ways to do it through remittance. So there is a, a huge interest and a huge um, a way to do it as long as we are able to now uh, get the financial institutions to be somehow recognized by these financial institution markets and payment gateways we're able to now connect and receive money through our crowdfunding platforms. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Mustafa. And it, it, it really is inspiring to hear that, that people are trying new things and, and really trying to make it work despite the challenges that we know exist in the market. Um, I know we've gone a few minutes over, so apologies uh, to you all for that, but thank you so much for, for sticking with us. Um, I, I'll take a few minutes just to wrap up. Um, we were super excited to host this conversation uh, between Sam Kaup and, uh, you know, and, and, and the Somali Response Innovation Lab. We would like to continue these conversations. Um, so we would, if, if, you would, if you enjoyed this and you would like to hear more um, about doing business in Somalia or about how entrepreneurship sort of meets development um, in Somalia, we, we are happy to sort of continue these conversations uh, digitally for, for now. Um, so please do just message us in the chat. Let us know what, what topics are of interest to you, what you might want to learn more about. Um, and we'll definitely, we would love to, to hear those thoughts and consider that as, as we move forward and possibly you know, continue this in a, in a small series. Um, the last thing that I would mention is that the San Cal Global Summit is coming up November 2nd to 6th. Uh, we would love to have, you know, some, some engagement there around Somalia and really putting Somalia on, a, on the global map um, as, as it's, it's really made its premiere on, on the top, innovation, top you know, innovation countries. Um, so please do join us, join us for that and we'd love to see more of you there. And hopefully we would love to see you all in future series uh, with the Response Innovation Lab. Um, maybe I'll hand it over to, to Nishant uh, to make some final remarks, but thanks everyone for joining and thank you so much again to our speakers. Um, Nishant? Perfect. Thanks again everyone for your interest. I hope that this helps with um, completing the narrative and filling in some of the gaps. Of course, many of you know, uh, normally the, the default narrative to Somalia is, is, is not so holistic. Um, and of course, we're not denying that there are challenges as you've heard today, um, but there are also significant opportunities and it gives us the space to, to be creative and innovative to further explore that. So um, again, the first of many, many more conversations. So thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm.